What a privilege it is to be in a fellowship like this and to enjoy inspiring music. And music that so singly gives praise and glory to Jesus Christ. The highest praise. Thank you very much, Calvary Singers, and for the children and for our great choir opening our service tonight with such joy at the end of this Palm Sunday. Guilt is a very painful experience. It's really a legal concept. And so when we talk about why we feel guilty, guilt comes because of relationships. Relationships to the law, for since guilt is a legal concept, guilt is that feeling that we feel in relationship to a requirement or a law. And guilt is also the feeling that comes as a result of the conscience. The conscience of man is also a reactor. It responds to personal expectations. So you might feel guilty about something that has absolutely nothing at all to do with the law of God, but has to do, let's say, with training. Or has to do with what someone else is expecting of you. So when we speak of guilt, we speak of two areas. One, law or requirement. And two, expectation or anticipation of conscience. Both the law of man and the law of God. And the response of the conscience are provided by God the creator for man. Now, guilt also becomes societal. America is now turning inward again as a result of those six shots outside of the Hilton. Why does America do such things? Aren't Buchwald, in his usual satire, said, we don't need to ban guns, all we need to do is ban bullets. We would not offend the Constitution at all, which allows for the bearing of arms on the part of Americans. But there's no constitutional assumption that we have a right to bear bullets, he says. So he would like bullets to be banned. You can have all the guns you want, but you just wouldn't be provided any of the ammunition. So the critics of America say the reason why America is so violent is because everybody has a handgun. And they've even traced the factory in Germany providing the parts for no country in the world is allowed to send full pieces of fire weaponry in the United States, but they provide parts. So the small factory in Germany that provided the part for the pistol that was assembled in North Miami, which was then shipped to Mr. Goldstein in Dallas, from which store John Warnock Hinckley purchased his Saturday night special. But if we'd take away the handguns and would take away the privilege to buy a hand piece and just let people by rifles or something they couldn't conceal, that possibly this would curtail the tendency toward violence. Or, the critics now are saying, it's part of our society. It's sick. And part of our psychological misunderstanding in America is that we fail to take responsibility individually and we love to place responsibility corporately. So the government is at blame or society is sick. And therefore society produces the John Hinckley's. And the articles in News and Time, even the international press this week and major press 
editorials that have come, even Jesse Jackson's editorial comment this week, place the responsibility on society. The blacks now are placing it upon whites. Something within society and the white community causes the kind of racism that produces the 23 victims in Atlanta. Some editorials suggest that the reason why this is happening now is because the Reagan administration is establishing cutbacks. And Mr. Kennedy is beginning now to blame the Reagan administration for the Reagan economic policy. Everyone passes the buck. And if society weren't so sick, and if America would not have the availability of the handgun, then some of these things wouldn't happen. And so we suffer from a national guilt syndrome. We're guilty because we're affluent. We're guilty bef before the world because we're so permissive. And other people are blamed for things that personally we are reluctant to be responsible for. So the gun went off. I blacked out. It fired. I didn't know what I was doing. And there is suggestion now that for the next three months, young John Hinckley will be studied and examined by psychiatrists and psychologists in the security prison in North Carolina. A small cell. He sits. Two people sitting next to his bed, constantly chronicling every movement he makes. Two more outside. His diet is regulated. Urine samples, blood samples, gestures, response. Every motion, every slight gesture is recorded. And psychologists will tell us who is responsible. The Wall Street Journal suggests... It's the type of upper-middle-class affluence, the work ethic of the evergreen Colorado-type community that produces this kind of thing. Everyone has an answer. Everyone placing guilt. Until we feel responsible for this act, we, therefore, will not be able to turn this country around. That's the type of psychology and philosophy that permeates America so that we all feel guilty, we all feel responsible that certain people had to ride in the back of the bus and certain people, although they have everything, somehow don't fit in life. And until we get all of those things right, America will never be correct in her existence in a free society. Guilt is a terrible thing. Guilt destroys the soul's surprise. Guilt about things that happen in the world are not the only kinds of guilt that afflict people in this room tonight. Many Christians live with a great deal of guilt. Part of the theme of the book of Galatians is based upon the bedrock assumption that there is guilt. People not feeling able to measure up, not feeling as if they're accepted, not feeling worthy. So many people, even in a church like this, don't feel worthy. They, they lose self-confidence. A great many of singles don't feel quite worthy, don't feel quite accepted. The whole question about marriage these days bases its very credibility, its legitimacy, its, its rightness in life on the fact that people feel less qualified in a more complex world to deal with the question of marriage. A man said to me the other day, I'd rather be unmarried than married to the wrong person. Well, of course, they're not the two options. You can be married to the right person. And as I sat with him and counseled with him in Jerusalem, a Christian leader that I met there by accident, I realized that the expectation and the broken fulfillment of marriage that he has watched through the years has caused him to shy away 
from the most rewarding and fulfilling experience other than trusting in Jesus Christ and that forming your own church by being the bridegroom or the bride in the marital bond. Guilt. Now there is false guilt. And that is based upon your breaking a law that really is not a legitimate law. A pseudo-law, a man-made law. We found that this morning in the text in the Gospel of John when they said to Jesus, you have no right to heal on the Sabbath day. You've broken a law. You should feel guilty. And of course, if it was made to feel guilty, he would then be accused of sin. Trying constantly, not only one, to check his authority, but to challenge him concerning his own culpability, his own guilt before God. You've just broken a law. But that was a law of man, so Jesus didn't feel guilty of that. The Sabbath was made, what for? For man? Or was man made for the Sabbath? Was that a law that man made, that God shouldn't heal on the Sabbath? And our Lord Jesus cut them to the quick. So many things that you and I feel guilty about are as a result of training or upbringing. Something that is part of your background, something that your family experienced. And so when you violate that, that law or that principle or that guideline that somebody established for you, either as a child or as an adult, you feel guilty. Now those guilt feelings can easily be treated and dissolved. And we'll see that in a couple of minutes. But I want to deal with the main question of modern man tonight, and possibly some in here are experiencing the kind of guilt that makes it impossible for you to feel the full, free forgiveness of God. Guilt is a legal concept based upon the infraction or the transgression or the breaking of the law of God and the conscience, therefore, responding to that and producing what we call guilt feelings. Expectations and regulations that you have failed to measure up to or you have broken and not measured up to in terms of keeping them. Turn in your Bible tonight to the book of Romans chapter 3. We see in this great tome explaining the meaning of the law of God, the first principle of why we feel guilty. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. It says, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. All of us have gone out of the way. Altogether we have become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. So there is a natural, legitimate feeling of not measuring up in every man's heart. We don't properly understand God. We want to, and that causes our life to be in disarray. We don't please God, we don't obey God, we don't properly understand God. And this comes because of the fall of man, because of his depravity, because of his inbred imperfection. He's a sinner. Everybody knows that. We're sinners by nature. We were born in sin. We are sinners by practice. We continue to do things that are wrong. And we are sinners by choice. We love God darkness rather than light, because our deeds are evil. Now this inability to be like God, this damaged soul that we live with, produces guilt, because we know we cannot measure up. And there's where the gospel is injected into our hearts. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all come short. We don't measure up. And when we understand that, and man does... He becomes guilty before God. Go to chapter 2 and we'll see the second thing that reminds us of this. In Romans chapter 2 
And in verse 15, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bears witness, and their thoughts constantly in the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. Here is the law of God imprinted in our hearts, our inabilities to know, to please, to obey God. And along with that standard that God has established as His law, there is our conscience, the sounding board, the amplifier, that which responds to what we know to be true, even though it's damaged, our conscience constantly excusing and accusing us. Now, sin also affects our understanding of guilt. Sin so scrambles us, so confuses us, that we don't quite understand even the law of God. And sin has damaged our sensitivity to ourselves. It has spoiled the sensitivity of the conscience. So the conscience doesn't even properly decipher its guilt. Truman Capote interviewed 285 mass murderers that are presently in prison. I heard him say this recently, that of the 200 and some mass murderers, people who have killed more than 10 people, he said not one of them feels any guilt at all. Sin has a way of scarring the conscience of man so that he sins beyond the point of his own responsibility, and he feels no guilt whatsoever before God. The other man that they caught, who has appeared in the press this week, said that even though he was accused and even though he was placed in prison, he would immediately after his release seek to kill the president. There are some people who are incorrigible sinners, and they feel no guilt whatsoever. And their ability to decipher that they are wrong and to be accused properly by God has been besmeared. And they are not sensitive at all to God. And they have removed themselves from any possible sensitivity to the law of God. They are without guilt as far as they're concerned. And their conscience has been dulled and seared as with a hot iron, the scripture says. And we find this in the book of Romans, that God willing, by His grace, in the next 18 months, we'll begin to study together that people actually have pleasure in unrighteousness. What is going through the mind of this man who will suffocate a retarded young child? What is behind that? Why would anyone want to kill a little child, today's observer, tells the story of the possible finding of the skull and the scattered bones of a little child in this town that is missing. What would be in the mind of man to do that? Well, when some of these persons are interviewed, they love it. They love it. And when you see multiple stab wounds, 500 stab wounds, that usually is the act of a homosexual or a lesbian. And the fury of killing and the mutilation of the flesh, police authorities will tell you when you read that, it's a homosexual or a lesbian. The passion and the fury and the sensuality is heightened and climaxed. And they feel no guilt at all. And Romans 1 says, they have pleasure in unrighteousness. And God has given them up. So the some today that have no sense of guilt or shame at all, sin, as it continues to reroot itself in the hearts of men, removes sensitivity and responsibility even to God. Guilt. Now, what is the answer to this feeling of guilt? How is guilt expunged? How can it be removed? Well, let's look at Ephesians 2.14 and we'll find the answer to that. We've defined it. 
We've determined its source. Now let's seek to establish its solution. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. In Ephesians chapter 2, the writer speaks three times of peace. Peace. For he is our peace, Ephesians 2.14. He's broken down this wall of partition. He's abolished in his flesh the enmity against God. And that word enmity means hostility to God. You see, as the sensitivity arises to responsibility toward God, the heart of man, hear me carefully, is infuriated because of the accusation of God. You can see them if you are privileged to preach or teach the scripture. You can see people becoming infuriated in a service. And they're restless and disturbed. And as in the preaching of St. Peter, they're goaded, pricked, a long prod was extended with a pin at the end to move the animals along. And they used those in stockyards in the Midwest. They poke the animal and prick him and stick him with a pin, a large knife to jab him, to move, he al move him along, to slaughter. It's the word that is used by the Lord Jesus who says to Paul, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. You can't fight against me. And you'll find many times in the preaching of the gospel, people will become infuriated because the announcement has been given that Jesus paid a price for them and they're in debt to God because of his love. And they've been accused by God for their sins. And they don't like it. And they resent it. That's why they crucified Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ gets a hold of you, and when the love of God is shed abroad in your heart, all of a sudden that enmity, that hostility, that feeling of being on the outs with God and that hatred of his exposure of your own responsibility vanishes. And Jesus Christ becomes the peace of God that passes all understanding. So we read of this peace in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14. He is our peace. By the blood of the cross, he removes the accusation. He takes away the guilt and the feeling of responsibility for the offense laid to us because we have broken the law of God and the expectations of God now are fulfilled in Jesus Christ who meets the demand of the law. You see, all guilt as a result of the breaking of a law must be resolved by punishment, as we'll see in a minute, and must be offset by reconciliation. Guilt is only removed by one, punishment for the broken law, and two, reconciliation by forgiveness. Many of you still have guilt about something, even though you know God has forgiven you. But the other half of the removal of the guilt has yet to take place. And that is to go to that person or have that person come to you and understand verbally and spiritually that forgiveness is now forthcoming and so you have reconciliation. You can be forgiven by God legally and not reconciled to your brother spiritually and emotionally. And as a result of that, you still feel guilt. Well, God's forgiven you, yes. And God has cleared you, yes. And God has exonerated you, yes. But the forgiveness and the reconciliation that you need to make and the establishment of fellowship has yet to be forthcoming. And we see this in a second passage in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. The second avenue of the possibility of the removal of guilt, not only by the Lord Jesus Christ in his work, satisfying the broken law, but secondly, in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, by drawing us to God. In 1 Peter we find both of these aspects of the removal of guilt in one verse. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also 
hath once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that, watch it, he might bring us to God, having put to death in his flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Suffered once for our sins, there's the punishment, and brought us to God, there's the reconciliation. How can I stop feeling guilty before God? Number one, accept Jesus Christ as the substitute for you. And most of you in this room tonight have done that. You see, the law of God has been broken by you and me. And that law must be satisfied, we say. Punishment has to be forthcoming after the law has been broken. That's why America is so miserable tonight. She doesn't really deal with guilt. She doesn't deal with guilt because she doesn't punish. If you would go to Greece tonight, you could walk on the street any time you'd want to. There are no drugs in Greece. There's no break-in. There's no rape. You know why? Because they either cut your hand off or they shoot you. Punishment is severe. You don't steal a thing. There's no crime in Israel. There's no alcoholism. The law is tight, severe. And America doesn't understand her guilt because she doesn't understand that laws must be punished. And if they're punished... That's one part of the removal of guilt. And so Jesus Christ is punished for me. God doesn't overlook my sin by saying, all right, Jesus Christ, it's fine. No, sir. Jesus dies. He suffers the penalty of sin, which is death. The wages of sin is death. I die physically because I've sinned, because Adam sinned. Sin is the greatest mirror to my responsibility to God and death is the other side of that mirror if I don't understand sin I understand it when I die death is like the two-way mirror that women use in putting on their makeup the one side's a regular mirror and then the other side magnified seven or eight times you can see your pores that's death when people die they're aware as never before of the fact of sin why do people die? Because they're sinners. And how is the law of God satisfied? Well, Jesus had to die. Capital punishment took place. I had to die for my sins. Jesus died for me. And so as far as a Christian is concerned, he never really dies. He walks through the valley of the shadow of death. I am the resurrection of the life. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never tell me die. There's no death for the believer. He's asleep in Jesus. There's no fear of death for the believer. But for the person without Jesus Christ, Hebrews 2 says, the fear of death is like a club that Satan wields over the world. The world is afraid to die. To do anything, anything not to die. So Jesus Christ pays the price of sin. He dies. What else does he do? He descends into the lower parts of the earth, Ephesians 2. He goes down in Sheol. He's separated from God. God turns his back from him. And we'll think about this very fact this week. Lamai, Lamai, Sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because Jesus Christ satisfied the law. The soul that sins shall surely die, the prophet said. He not only satisfies the law, pays the full price of sin. In my place condemned, he stood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. But he reconciles me to God. Look at it in the text. 1 Peter 3.18 He brings me to God. So not only am I exonerated from meeting the measure of the broken law of God. But notice, secondly, I am brought into fellowship with God. And I'm almost through now tonight. That's where the feeling of forgiveness begins. 
Legally, I know that before the law, my meeting of the law has been satisfied by Jesus Christ. But spiritually, intuitively, experientially, I feel the removal of guilt because I've been brought into relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, follow carefully. You can be a Christian and out of fellowship with God. You can have the record set completely clear as far as your destiny is concerned and as a Christian be disturbed because you're out of fellowship with God. You can know partially the work of God's exoneration and forgiveness as far as the law is concerned, but not know the drawing, intimate closeness of Jesus Christ in your life. And so many believers don't have assurance. They feel that strange feeling. They know they have tasted the heavenly gift. They know that they are saved. They listen to the gospel. The facts are true. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But they still feel uncertain about it. And they have lost confidence in their faith. Jesus died for them, but somehow they don't feel as if they've been brought into relationship with Jesus Christ. What's the answer to that? One more verse and I'm through. Let's go to 1 John. In 1 John, we find the solution to this problem of being forgiven and not being guilty before the judgment bar of God, but yet not experiencing the feeling of being guilt-free. And so we read in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You can lose the feeling of forgiveness by being out of fellowship with God. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, look at the text, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, keeps on cleansing us from sin. Cleansing comes as a result of confession. And we need to confess before the Lord our failure, our lapse of faith, our shortcomings, our want of Him, our lack of hunger for Him, our failure to do the things that we know that we should do, and our failure to keep from us the things that we should stay far away from. And we need to confess that. And when we do, the feeling of being guilt-free takes place. And we feel cleansed and exonerated and free. And the fresh breeze of the peace of God passes all understanding and continues to keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let's look at one other verse in 1 John. Turn to chapter 3, please, in verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in reality. For by this we know that we are of the truth and shall be constantly assured and secure in our hearts before Him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, loved ones of God, this is not for the non-believer. If our heart does not condemn us, then have we confidence toward God. Guilt comes because of condemnation. Because we see the law of God and we've broken the law. Guilt comes because of the expectation of God and our failure to measure up. 
Guilt is dissolved by accepting the work of Jesus Christ, who is our peace, who resolves the hostility, the enmity that exists between God and me. By his death on Christ, he is condemned for me. By his sacrifice, he exonerates me. He pays the broken law for me. He is punished in my place. He satisfies the requirement of a just God who cannot overlook the broken law, who must punish. He punishes His Son. He puts Him to grief. And then He draws me to Himself. And I'm brought in reconciliation and fellowship with God. But then that feeling goes away. And that feeling of being free of guilt that feeling somehow is dissolved again. It's because I've failed to confess. I've failed to keep up with the fact that I must constantly be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, by my honesty before God. And as I confess, He's faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse from all unrighteousness. And the feeling of being condemned goes away. And I have confidence toward God. So the Christian tonight is not guilty and should not feel guilty before God because Jesus Christ suffered for us and brings us into relationship with Him. Why do we feel guilty? Because we have broken the law of God and because His expectation of us causes us to realize that we fall short. What's the solution to that failure to measure up to God that produces the guilt feeling? Accepting Jesus Christ, who pays the price of sin and is punished in our place. And by the process of His becoming the sacrifice for us, God draws us to Himself. And we have freedom in God's grace. But Ross, I still feel that I'm not quite sure about this thing. I still lack assurance and confidence. Well, then you need cleansing. Possibly you're continuing to practice known sin. Possibly you're abusing the fact that God will not accuse you, but has already accused and accepted Jesus Christ as your substitute. Probably you're playing with grace. You're continuing to do that which you know is dead wrong before God. Confess it. Admit it. Surrender it. Turn from it. Yield it to God. Submit it to Him now. If your heart is condemning you, it's condemning you for a reason. If Jesus Christ satisfies all that I am to be responsible for to God, then I need to have a heart that doesn't condemn me. And if my heart does condemn me, I don't have confidence before God. And I need to go back to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. I need to confess and ask Him to give me again the feeling of forgiveness. Guilt has been removed by the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. That's a fact. But believe it tonight, you want to feel it too. You want to feel it too. You should feel it. Because Jesus Christ's sacrifice was sufficient. He suffered the just for the unjust that He might bring us to God. And the climax of the freedom from guilt is the fact that you have been reconciled to God and you live in his holy fellowship of complete acceptance by the work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, help us to be free from the feeling of guilt since Jesus Christ has made us free from the law. And grant that these truths shall permeate deep in our hearts tonight. And if our heart is condemning us, O oh Lord, help us even with damaged conscience 
to ask thee tonight to remove from us that which we know to be an offense to God. Cause a wave of confession to come throughout this room tonight. Many claiming right now, as one of the elders prayed, the discernment and the understanding of the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, who will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And while we're bowed in prayer, without the showing of a hand or any visible sign at all, I challenge you, believer, tonight to confess to our dear Lord right now any shortcoming. Anything that you are continuing to do that you know by the conviction of the Spirit of God to be wrong. Come clean with Him tonight. Come to the laver as they did and be washed by His blood. You say, Ross, I've tried. Well, then stop trying and begin trusting. But of Christ, we thank Thee that guilt has been resolved and dissolved by Jesus Christ's all-sufficient work. May God's people feel it tonight, fresh, clean, accepted, and then walking in the fullness of your fellowship. We pray in Jesus' blessed name, and all God's people said, Amen.